You can ask any pastor. The question we hear over and over again in one form or another is this one. Why do bad things happen to good people? The ones who ask it are usually sitting in our studies, weeping, pulling one tissue after another out of the box. Someone they love has just been diagnosed with cancer. A nephew has been killed in a car accident. A neighbor has died in Afghanistan. And we pastors sit there listening, nodding our heads, feeling their pain, offering all the comfort we can, but what we really wish we had was an answer to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Theologians call this the problem of evil, and they usually set it up like this. God is all-loving. God is all-powerful. Terrible things happen. Frederick Buechner says we can reconcile any two parts of that equation, but not all three parts at the same time. We can say that terrible things happen because God is all-loving, but not all-powerful. Or we can say that terrible things happen because God is all-powerful, but not all-loving. Neither of those answers is very helpful to the person who is sitting in the pastor's study. So when I was in seminary, I took a course called The Problem of Evil. We spent the semester looking at all the available options, and at the end we wrote a paper in which we were supposed to offer our own solution to the problem. The one that made the most sense to me was a modification of a solution offered centuries ago by a man named Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers, who said that God has put us in the kind of world where souls can be made and suggested that soul-making requires suffering. I said it like this, that what God wants, in the same way any parent wants it, is for his children to grow up any father who has watched his daughter cross the street for the first time by herself knows how frightened he is to let go of her hand and how proud he is when she makes it to the other side. That kind of fear and pride stem from his understanding that she might not make it, that we do live in a world where terrible things happen. Irenaeus would say that this world is a veil of soul making. It's the kind of place where the children of God can grow up. Now, it all sounded good on paper. I may have even gotten an A in that class. But honestly, it wasn't much comfort to the next mother who sat in my study grieving the loss of a child. She couldn't understand why the making of her soul had to be so painful, couldn't understand why her child hadn't been given the chance to grow up, if that's what God is so interested in. I didn't know what to say. I just offered her a fresh box of tissues. But when we get to a place like this one in the Gospel of Luke where some people come to Jesus telling him about these Galileans whose blood had been mingled with their sacrifices, wondering how God had allowed such a thing to happen, I sit up and pay attention. Because it sounds as if Jesus himself is about to answer the question definitively, why do bad things happen to good people? Except that's not the question he is being asked. In those days, people didn't believe that bad things happened to good people. They believed that bad things happened to bad people. They solved the problem of evil by assuming that God was all-powerful, but not necessarily all-loving. Or maybe they would have said it this way, that there are times when love is trumped by justice, that doing the right thing is even more important than doing the kind or loving thing. Maybe Paul himself would have said that in our reading from 1 Corinthians for today. He says again and again, 
God delivered justice to his people. He corrected their behavior. He showed them the straight and narrow. Maybe these people who came to Jesus asking why God had allowed Pilate to destroy these Galileans in the very act of worship weren't asking why God allowed it, but why God did it. What terrible sin had these Galileans committed to deserve a death like that? It's tempting, isn't it? To find a reason to look for some place to lay the blame. But listen to the way Jesus deals with this incident. He says, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Which is not the answer I was looking for. Jesus doesn't tell us why bad things happen to good people. He simply reminds us that death comes to all people, sooner for some, later for others, but none of us is going to get out of this world alive. That's true, isn't it? And when he says, unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did, he doesn't mean that unless you repent, you will die suddenly and tragically. He simply means that you will die without having an opportunity to repent. And so you'd better seize the opportunity now to get right with God. You never know when death is going to come. And that's true as well. Those children who used to pray, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take did it because their parents knew life is fragile. Death could come at any time. You want to be ready for that. It's why we ask God to forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive the trespasses of others. We pray that prayer regularly because none of us wants to find ourselves suddenly and unexpectedly in the presence of God holding a big smelly bag full of sin. Forgive us. Let it go. When some who were present asked Jesus about those Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, Jesus said, you'd better repent and you'd better do it quickly. It could happen to you. It's true, of course, but it's not the answer I was looking for. Can't imagine that it's going to be all that comforting to the next person who comes to my study grieving the loss of a loved one when I say, well, you know, we're all going to die. Might as well get used to it. Might as well repent while you have the chance. It's not the answer they are looking for. But I think there is an answer in today's gospel reading, and I think it comes in the next section. Jesus tells a parable about a man who had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, but when he came looking for fruit, he didn't find any. And so he said to his gardener, I've been coming for three years looking for fruit on this tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Replace it with another tree. Why should this one use up the soil? 